Thanks, Ahmad and Saad. That was a great presentation. We'll go ahead and go over our plan now for left breast and lymph nodes. This is Anthony Maglieri. And Vanessa Maglieri. And uh, this is a plan that I originally started, a static field IMRT plan. And uh, we ran out of time. Vanessa actually ended up taking it over and tweaking it out and turning it in. And you can see that she scored uh, 15 out of 400 plans from submitted from 55 countries. It's a really incredible international plan challenge. We were plan competition that we were really proud to be a part of. And uh, yeah, we got 15th, and some of the Eclipse scores came out a little lower than I had anticipated that they would, and uh, we actually figured out why that is, so stay tuned towards the middle of the presentation. We'll kind of go over that in a little bit more detail. But first, let's tell you about um, about our plan. What, what I had in my pocket, so I had Eclipse version 30.6 and Acuros XB, a true beam with Millennium 120, and I have used eight beam with 10x and one beam with 6x. So we have done IMRT. And uh, I'll tell you about our beams. So when you make a static field IMRT plan, the most important thing is your beam arrangement. Um, and not just uh, picking between the number of beams equally spaced. I'm talking about putting a lot of thought into really placing each beam strategically uh, when deciding where your sharpest dose gradient should be. Uh, in your plan, which is usually right around the edges of your target or between your target and an organ at risk, making sure you have a beam that kind of bisects that uh, and and creates the, the place where the jaw or the leaves can be right against those two and create that gradient. In this case, it's the chest wall. So you got a kind of a 3D representation. Normally when I treat these in the clinic, I do a coplanar arrangement, but I'm not allowed up to three non-coplanar beams for this competition, so I try to take advantage of that. And this particular beam arrangement is non-coplanar. I'll walk you through that. But don't worry. At the end of the presentation, I'll show you an, a coplanar beam arrangement as well that uh, is a little bit more representative to what we would do in the clinic every day with this type of case. But for now, you guys can see exactly what we did for this plan challenge. And um, the very first step in creating these beams, like I mentioned before, is you need to find an arrangement that will create a very sharp dose gradient around uh, the most important place in your plan, whatever it may be. In this particular case, it's the chest wall. We really want to drop off dose very, very quickly right along this chest wall to make as little dose as possible to the heart and lungs. So to do that, uh, normally I would just pick one beam and, and crank the gantry over as far as I can. Um, in this case, it uh, looks like we got almost uh, quite a few degrees off of, uh, off of AP here. And this would normally be my first beam, but since we were allowed three non-coplanar, we actually kicked the couch 13 degrees in either direction. And, um, and split that up because this first beam will often have quite a bit of fluence, quite a bit of monitor units, and uh, have entrance dose that could streak. So by splitting up the, uh, where the source of these beams come from, that entrance dose was spread across two. Again, this is something that's probably more unique to the plan challenge than uh, our plan competition than uh, sort of I do in the clinic because the therapist probably wouldn't appreciate it if I asked them to move the couch three times for the patient. But regardless, these are the first two beams. Um, the third and final non-coplanar beam that was allowed for this competition was an on-foss beam. And uh, I don't always do an on-foss beam. Later on, I'll show you the alternative to an on-foss beam, which I call the cross-up beams. But in this case, um, we used a non-coplanar on-foss beam that was foot to head. And originally, I actually tried to, tried to follow the angle of the chest wall and make this a little bit more aggressive, 5 or 10 degrees more aggressive. Um, and I thought that would clear the patient's knees fine, especially if there was no knee sponge. But when Vanessa took it over, she thought that that was perhaps too aggressive for something she might be comfortable with in her clinic. So she actually lowered uh, the aggressiveness of this beam, ended up with a 45 degree uh, gantry rotation with a 90 degree couch kick. And uh, you can see by doing this, the exit dose is less going through the lung and heart and uh, more going through the muscle and fat uh, superior to the breast. So that does work out really well. I usually save this for a sequential boost when I've already met the maximum heart dose um, when setting up a beam arrangement for a sequential boost. But since this was a single uh, prescription plan, this one I implemented in the main beam arrangement. So you've seen the, the most uh, medial beams, and you have saw the uh, Anfos non-coplanar beam. Let's go through the rest of the beams. So what I'd call beams four and five here, um, this one basically would probably be the most tangent beam that you'd use in a standard 
uh, in the standard plan when trying to treat this. So again, this is probably the, my most second medial beam. Uh, the first one was split into two as I went over before. This one again, you can see this particular jaw when it moves up here will define this gradient right here along the chest wall. And the same is true with this, uh, this fifth beam here. This, this jaw will come over here and define this line on the chest wall. And you can see those two laid out here in 3D as well. And of course, the actual collimator and gantry rotations are seen below. And uh, let's go over the rest of these beams. We kind of just threw them on here. Um, Oh, this one actually looks pretty on Voss, but uh, maybe this is uh, no, no, this is a uh, couch at zero. So looks like we used this on Voss beam here to, uh, and this was our only six X beam, if I remember correctly. So this kind of helped fill in all of the um, the dose that may be not quite all the way to the surface, since we used 10 X for all the other beams, and then um, the rest of these beams as well. Uh, I can show you some beams I view, but they weren't, uh, they were fixed to only treat uh, this port. So like this particular PA beam is not actually going to treat all the way over here. All right, so here is just another 3D view of the beams. And here's a 3D view again. You can see these non-coplanar beams here and this non-coplanar beam, and then the rest of the beams spread out this way. And here's the entire beam arrangement. Again, this is specific to this particular patient, just like all of your beam arrangements should be. Um, and I'll go over kind of a more generic approach to making a coplanar beam arrangement at the end of this presentation. So now Vanessa will tell you about kind of the structures that we use when optimizing the plan. So we use uh, a nine, 95 per ring. So it's a ring um, 2.5 millimeter wide minus uh, the heart and the lung. And it's 1.5 centimeter away from the target. Uh, it's more for remove the 95% of the dose, um, for be a little more conformal, but we still be 1.5 centimeter away from the target because we still need to put some dose between. The NS ring, so this ring is 0 0.8 centimeter wide and is touching the target. Um, we have put a max dose of 53 gray for this ring. It's really, f it's really more for remove the hotspot outside the target. Then we have created a hotspot here. Uh, it's a special structure for uh, try to have the hotspot inside the, inside the lobectomy. And our PTV total eval optimis op opt. Uh, we remove the hotspot here just for try to avoid the conflict in the optimizer. So for the optimization constraint, uh, we have put a maximum iteration to 2000 and ma maximum optimization time 6000 and use a resolution of 2.5 millimeter. And those are the maximums allowed in version 13 for your uh, iterations and optimization time. So here it's a screenshot of all the constraints we use for this plan competition. Um, so we have not start uh, by uh, this constraint, but it's really our end constraint. Yeah, this is what we ended up with. And you can see there's not a whole lot of magic in these constraints. Um, basically, we just ended up coming up with some normal good constraints and then a couple different dose-specific structures to try to control the hotspot. Every time we use a automatically contour the dose at a certain level. We would obviously delete where it overlapped with the hotspot here because that's the contour that we were actually asking it to put dose there. We came up with that basically because that was the hottest spot on some of our original optimizations that ended up on top of the, the GTV. So we said, okay, we want to keep this one here. We want to remove all the rest of them so we can get our hotspot inside our GTV, which is not usually something I see in most protocols, but it's oftentimes in these planned competitions. So. It's a, it's a good trick to make it work. And we have used NTO, but not with a very big priority, only 85. And uh, so like you, like you can see, 0.6 centimeter from the target. Uh, we start at 105% and add at 60%, uh, with a fall off not very strong, 0.05, because uh, we don't want to be too conformal and too restrictive. 
yeah, if there's any plan that you're going to use the NTO the least on, it's these breast plants because they're, by definition, not uniformly conformal. You want it to really spread out the dose into the uh, lateral side of the patient, and you want it to be very, very sharp gradient along the chest wall. So every plan, it's a good idea to use the NTO, but in cases like this, you just don't put much priority on it. And these are very non-aggressive uh, numbers to use, so that's, that's why it's there. So the calculation option, we have used a calculation grid resolution of 0.25. Um, yeah, we just did, it did a heterogeneity correction, and in Acuros you can choose whether you want it to be dose to medium or dose to water. Definitely use dose to medium for best results. And here's a picture of our scorecard. Do you want to say anything about this? All right, so basically with this particular competition, you have to decide, you know, what you want to focus on and what you don't. This right breast max dose, which is basically the dose to 0.03 cc's in the right breast, um, we, I initially put together some plans that were making this constraint, but everything else was very compromised to do so, at least with this beam arrangement, probably because I had those two non-coplanar beams that went through so much of it. Um, so with a different beam arrangement, this may not be as necessary, but with this particular plan, to get a good scoring plan, I basically had to ignore this and lose those two points and focus on just trying to prevent 5% from uh, getting above, much above 2 gray, which is what we did here. So our max dose in that breast, you know, right along the edge there, did pay a penalty, but we were able to at least maintain that 5% of the breast didn't get any more than 2 gray, by 2.2 in this case. Um, otherwise, uh, everything else went pretty well. W one thing that's also important to point out here is uh, the V20 and the heart mean dose, uh, and then the V5 especially, these were things that uh, the Acuros algorithm really helped us keep up and uh, keep competitive. We've got a slide to talk about that here. So first of all, let's talk about Acuros versus AAA. So that would be the circles and the squares in this presentation. So we started with AAA, which is what comes default on Eclipse systems, and we started calculating. And if I go back to the scorecard, um, what we saw when we took the exact same plan and calculated it with AAA and calculated with Acuros is actually almost the same score. Um, but what we saw is that we were easily meeting our V5 um, when we did a AAA calculation, but our V20 was actually slightly worse. But I knew in this plan the V5 would be the hardest thing to, to make, so I thought if I concentrate on, on, a, on controlling my V20, which is much easier to control, and then I can let the V5 go up a little bit. So um, going back to this slide, this is actually not our plan. This is actually one of the top scoring plans from the plan challenge. Um, and we got a copy of the uh, plan file and the dose file, and we imported it into our Eclipse system, and then we recalculated it three different ways. And that would be the uh, original calculation method, which was collapsed cone, which you can see in these um, triangles here. And then you've got the um, circles, which are AAA, and the middle one here is Acuros XP. And this particular DBH curve you're looking at is the, um, is the ipsilateral lung. And you can see there's a massive difference based on just even, so obviously the, um, the collapsed cone is on a different system with a, presumably a different beam model. So it, it's not as sure that it's comparable. However, the AAA and the Acuros XB are the same beam data, same beam model, um, which they're derived from. And you can still see um, pretty good differences between the two. So with just looking at AAA and Acuros, you can say that um, it looks like AAA overestimates the dose um, in, the, in the low dose portion of the plan for the, basically the V5 in the lung, um, and at least when compared to, AAA, or to Acuros. So with that said, that's probably why a lot of the submissions with AAA couldn't score as well. Um, maybe a couple other reasons too. Maybe they were trying too hard to meet that um, 0.03 cc in the contralateral breast or whatever, but even still, it's very difficult to, uh, to get a, a good score when you have to pay like a 10% additional penalty using um, a, a V5 using AAA versus Acuros. And then even further still, um, these plants that were calculated with collapsed cone got uh, an additional advantage of apparently even calculating, estimating less dose to that low dose portion of the lung. And of course, 
this is something very hard to calculate. This is usually under the jaw. This is outside of the field, and it's in a very low-density material. So you can understand why there might be some discrepancy in this area, but this discrepancy obviously directly affects the score. And uh, the same is a little bit true to the heart, not as much. I mean, I will also point out the collapsed cone, even at V20, is still, uh, at least when compared to these other two with completely different beam models, so it may not be all that comparable, but still a, a, a point or two, a percentage point or two uh, lower. So to me, this, uh, this completely um, explains why there's such a discrepancy in scores between these different calculation algorithms. Um, but it def definitely, I can't say which one is more or less accurate. You actually have to do tests, and, uh, and we haven't done those tests, so we don't know. But this at least explains why there's a difference in score. So I wanted to end by talking about uh, coplanar beam arrangement. And um, I just thought I'd lay out some of my standard tips for making a static field IMRT plan with uh, a coplanar beam arrangement. Again, you're going to start with your most medial field. You're going to see exactly how far you can move that over without colliding with the patient and try to utilize it. And as a rule of thumb, I try to do my next two fields 20 degrees from that. So if, if this was 60 degrees from AP, then this one would be 40 and then 20 for the first three fields. And then instead of doing that you know, non-coplanar um, field that you saw in this case, I do a pair of cross-up beams that end up being um, instead of my on FOSS beam. And then finally, I fix all jaws, and the beams that end up being the most PA will only end up treating that uh, the lateral side. You don't, you're not going to try to go across the whole plan to treat the medial portion with uh, with your most PA beams. And I'll show pictures of this in a second. Um, I like to manually split fields and possibly use different energies. Um, so if a field has to be um, split and one part goes across the entire chest wall, like a lateral beam, where it would cross the entire chest wall, and one part that would just go into the lateral portion of the patient, maybe the part that both basically exits all the way through lung would be six, and the part that goes through the chest wall and, and never exits through lung could be 15. Um, so consider splitting the fields and changing the beam energies on either side of the split. Um, you definitely want to place the beams to mimic the um, chest wall shape, which we talked about, and uh, the remaining beams end up being 20 degrees apart 10 degrees from opposing those medial beams. And hopefully this will all make sense when I show you in the next few slides. But you want to verify that the resulting beam arrangement is concave. I think that's very, very important because if you think about a convex beam arrangement, it only has no place to go with the exit dose but through the heart and lung, where that's not true with the concave beam arrangement. So let's talk about that. Here's a picture of exactly what I'm talking about. Oops. So here are those first three beams that are 20 degrees apart. These two are the cross-up beams, which you can actually see here. Why they're considered cross-up beams is because this beam actually treats this side of the breast, and this beam treats this side of the breast. And you can kind of see that here, where they almost cross. Um, and then this is the lateral beam that defines the edge of the target. I'll show you guys that when we get to it. And then these last beams just split the difference between these entrance beams, and then we, we move down there and have a PA beam to create this concave beam arrangement. This is what I mean by concave. I hope that makes sense. So here's a picture of those first two beams. Um, you can see usually I only want, um, this is particularly a chest wall case, not a breast case, but you, it's the same uh, method. Um, you only want one beam to actually go through the uh, contralateral breast if you can at all help it. And, uh, your second beam 20 degrees from it right there. I didn't show the third beam, but it would just be another 20 degrees from that. Oops, looks like we went a little too far. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's, this is the cross-up beams that I was talking about before. And you can see the idea here is that this beam actually goes comes from here but treats this half, and this beam comes from here and treats this part of the target. And usually I just, and here's the beams I view relative for both of those. And, and the reason that is is because then this beam can exit more through um, muscle and fat and not through as much of the lung. Same is true with this beam. So it's just another way to just find another way to, just whatever way you can to minimize heart and lung dose. And that's a nice way to do it rather than an on FOSS beam, which only exits through heart and lung. These beams, at least part of the part that treats the target, exits through, not through the ipsilateral lung and heart. So I hope that makes sense. And I just make my beam 
to the far edge. If this one's treating this part, I'm taking it to the medial edge. If this one treats this part, I'm taking it to the lateral edge. And then I'm going as far as I can without a carriage split in the other direction. So lateral edge, as far as I can without a carriage split. Medial edge, as far as I can without a carriage split. And then let's talk about the uh, remaining three beams. So um, I, guess I, did, I guess I skipped one that's important. And that's the lateral beam here. And you can't see it visualized, but I just want to point out the shape of the target. So the shape of the target here defines which kind of lateral beam I would use. And I def definitely want, sometimes the target shape ends up more like this, and you want a lateral beam that, that traces that out. But in this case, it looks like I probably use like 95 degrees to make this lateral beam, because you can see this particular line isn't quite lateral, but just a little bit more than that. So there would be a beam that could help define this edge, and it would shoot straight here at uh, 95 degrees, I think. And then from here, you're actually going to look at creating the rest of the shape. So this beam, obviously, the jaw would be able to come here and kind of help create this part of the shape, this beam with this part of the shape. And the reason I use this PA beam is because there's a part of the shape here that actually points straight posterior. So if you have your beam arrangement defined to create this entire chest wall shape, including this PA beam, you'll do uh, really well. And you can see these last couple beams, they don't um, treat the entire target. It makes no sense to treat the, a target in the medial part going through the entire lung to treat this here. So I just treat, um, basically, I think as far as I can get again without exceeding um, a carriage split. So here you have it. And of course, the reason that static fields in my mind are, at least at this time, superior to VMAT is because I can pick the ideal collimator rotation for each of these beams. And you can see that here. With VMAT, you're stuck with one collimator rotation throughout the arc. You can kind of see that we're always picking a beam to keep the jaws as small as possible every step of, of the way here. So. so just uh, general trips and tips and tricks. You know, ask for reasonable things from the optimizer. Don't drastically overshoot. What I mean by that is my priorities um, won't well overshadow the default uh, smoothing of 30 and 40, X and Y. So if you never have to touch the smoothing, if you don't ask for more than 150 or 200 as a general rule of thumb for your um, optimization criteria, your priorities. If you start going way up well over that, you might want to consider increasing your smoothing because everything in the, in the uh, optimizer is relative. So if 30 and 40 are designed to be relative to you know 100 to 200 for a max on your priorities, but if your priorities are now all, all 5 and 600, then you might want to consider doubling the smoothing because it's all relative. I never touch the smoothing, but I never exceed uh, 150 or 200 with a very rare exception. Um, obviously, don't create conflicts in the optimizer. You can't tell to do two things at the same time that aren't possible. You won't get good results. Don't do it. Um, I like to tune with the NTO or you know, use rings if you're not comfortable with the NTO or you uh, have a different treatment planning system. Let the total cost function line get completely flat. It, it's usually tuned to... Uh, to tell you, oh, it's done, but if you let it keep going with, with static field IMRT, it will continue to go until it's completely flat. And if you're doing a VMAT plan, this wasn't a VMAT example, but pause the optimizer at each sub-step, and uh, it ends up being a ten, total of 10 times. But if you let the optimizer get completely flat before it goes to the next step, you will get a better plan every time, although it obviously does significantly increase your time to optimize the patient. Um, things not to forget um, when you're doing a clinical plan like this, Stomach dose and liver dose, if you have a really large breasted patient, can be something that you easily forget. So look inferior to your lung. And if your dose gradient doesn't match along the chest wall, inferior to your lung, and you see dose just start spilling into your stomach or liver, consider creating an op structure. So what I'll do is usually like extend the lung inferiorly and then constrain similar to how I would constrain the lung, just so I can see a matching dose gradient along the chest wall. Even after I get outside the lung, there's no reason for dose to spill. If you can control the dose for the lung, you can continue to control the dose inferiorly for the liver or the stomach as well. Don't forget to add flash. It's very easy to do with static field IMRT. There's a tool called the skin flash tool, or you can edit the fluence manually. Either way works. But on beams that are tangent to the breast, you want to create flash to make your plan a little bit more robust. Finally, uh, if you have a true beam, you have jaw tracking, enable it. It makes it very noticeable difference, especially in your low doses, having the jaws protect the, uh, the lung and heart and having less interleaf leakage is really helpful. So enable jaw tracking if it's there. I think that's uh, the end of our little lecture here.
So thank you, Ahmad, for your amazing work, time, and effort so we can learn and evolve together. Thank you, Ahmad. Yeah, thanks, Ahmad. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for such an informative uh, talk. And I really appreciate the time that you took, uh, Anthony, to to take this, to, to do this case um, use, using uh, uh, coplanar uh, fields. That's really great. I appreciate that. And I hope now things are clear. This shows that good inputs lead, lead to good outputs. So what, if you selected the, the if you contour, if you added the, the proper contouring, and you, if you own also understood the, the, the geometry of the contours, where exactly they are located from the target, and after that you selected the proper field geometry, like which angle, uh, what energy, what is the location of the isocenter, what is the field size, what's kilometer angle, all these kind of things should be taken into consideration. So good contouring, good arc geometry, and or field geometry, and also good optimization uh, uh, criteria inserted. So all these kind of combinations need to be all together as uh, considered as good inputs in order for the system to really process it properly and then get you uh, a good output. So this is the main goal of this competition is, is to share the good inputs of experts worldwide with, with, with other planners so that they will try to, to sharpen their skills and improve their, their, their plans in a, in, a, in a better way. I really appreciate Anthony and Van Vanessa your time and effort to present this uh, case for, uh, for planners worldwide. I really appreciate that and we're really happy to have you among us um, in, in this competition and we hope that we will be with us even in, in the future and also will help us in, in, in even managing and organizing this, co this competition. Thank you very much guys. Thank you. Thank